Well, I've spent a watch at least, you know, yeah. but yeah. yeah. Cool. So, yeah, if I had if I had something I could do virtually, do you have any ideas that I'm kind of paddling uh, out? Yeah. You probably, I'm sure I can come up with Oh, Shimshi. Um, I want to get him out there. He, okay, everyone, for our next talk, we have our interviewer, Steve Edwards from Columbia Mr. University, Bernardo. interviewing Dave Haney and Andy Finkel, Commodore Engineers, former Commodore Engineers, talking about Amiga, Amiga, Amiga chips. Thank you, guys. Everything was smaller or not. <laughs> yeah, Commodore, light years ahead. Ooh. Ooh. Um, but I, I decided that, you know, that, that's, have you seen the Amiga? You know? Commodore was not really great at uh, coming up with original t shirts. Com Commodore in the U.S. had worse swag. You go to Canada, you go to Germany, you yeah. get some great swag. They, they had all kinds of stuff. All right, and this is a classic. God is in this excitement. <laughs> so I, I rejected that idea of going through, you know, just a few of the top ones. Do Do you have a Jackbusters T-shirt? I have a Jackbusters T-shirt. Uh, yeah. uh, yes, a classic. <laughs> <laughs> So that's it's been like 40 years, and 
you know, trying to get, figure out and remember the exact schedule of when things happen, that's something I'm not usually good at. But in this case, I have uh, high-tech weapons, engineering notebooks. Ooh. Back then, every engineer had to keep engineering notebooks. You wrote everything you did on them. The pages cannot be removed without uh, causing getting a mess. And uh, I actually have engineering, all the engineering notebooks from that period. So I can actually tell what happened when. Um, I worked for Sig Hartman back then, and I was his, well, I was manager of uh, the application software group, uh, but he was, I was also his technical go-to guy. So I actually got to hear about all the uh, high-tech things, because Sig wanted to find out and run, ask, get opinions about what other managers and division heads were telling him, whether it was real or not. So I would hear about a lot of things. I would actually go to engineering meetings, even though I was in the software department, software division. Uh, so I got to hear a lot of the, the back story behind stuff like this. So let's see. Got that one. OK, so this was just before any of the Amiga stuff happened on May 21st, 1984. Uh, Marshall Smith was the big boss at the time, if anyone remembers him. Uh, and this is from an engineering staff meeting. We were doing a product review. Top four projects at engineering at the time were the C-128. It was due quarter, first quarter, 1985. The PC, it was due the fourth quarter, 1984. The Z-8000 machine, that was due the second quarter, 1985 and the LCD machine, which was due sometime in the future. And we, at that point, we started looking at or talking about next generation machines. So we scheduled a futures meeting. I don't, I, I don't have a complete, complete list of attendees, but we were looking at what we can do next after those four projects were completed. And at that meeting, we decided our main target, our focus, was to beat the Apple IIc. <laughs> that was our, at that point we decided that was the biggest threat to Commodore. Um, and I guess I, at that point, uh, at that meeting, I got a really annoying question, which, what, how do we get, how do we, what, what can we develop to start, what do we need to start writing the software for a m new machine before the first prototype is built, or even designed? Because right now, that back then, they decided that software was the problem. That was why we were always so slow at bringing out new machines. Now, if we could only get the software done first, then it would simplify everything. It's, it's, it's like a negative time latch that can solve all kinds yep. of circuit problems. Yep. Yep. Okay. yep. We could fix the problems in hardware via software before the hardware even exists. There you go. We well, need the hardware. This, this, <laughs> this is how it's done yes. these days. On June 8th, we had a senior engineering staff meeting. And uh, Martin Shavilsky, who is uh, Adam Chonak's go-to guy at that point for technical stuff, uh, who I actually later worked with, he's a good guy, uh, he gave a competitive analysis of all the other computers around and all of the rumored computers. And that was the first mention anyone in engineering had heard of the Omega computer, with an O. And uh, so we, we, we heard about it, we thought it had some interesting features, so uh, I was given the task of researching it. Um, on June 12th, 1984, there was a general manager's meeting in Europe. Word came back, or panicked word came back, that the GMs demanded a new machine for Christmas 85. They weren't happy with the projects engineering was working on. They wanted a 16 or 32-bit CPU, an 8-bit bus, and 64K of RAM, and a graphics processor with Bitlet and raster ops. And because they were all disturbed by the, the Sinclair QL, which was going to take the market by storm, we couldn't <laughs> We put none of our current machines would compete against that. And so they were very concerned. But we were already doing, okay, in the staff meeting, we were decided we were already doing four machines. We just didn't have the resource to, to do a fifth. So we needed something short term 
Right? We didn't really mind if it became an orphan product, you know, not part of the Commodore family, never, not compatible with anything, never to be seen after this one Christmas. So we decided that the only way to do that was to buy the technology from the existing group and help them get it to uh, finish the product. And if, we, if they picked the right CPU, we could at least stick with the CPU for future stuff, but uh, we didn't really care. On the 19th, see how fast this is running? Uh, we got the uh, full specs of the Omega computer. It had a 68,000, 7.5 MHz, 128K of RAM, expandable to 512K, 64K of ROM, custom animation bitlet, display sync coprocessor, uh, 640 by 400, high, high resolution with 3,016 colors. No one could figure out how that. <laughs> Eight reusable sprites, 80 column color text with 40 columns on a standard TV, custom sound peripheral chip with four voices, nine octaves, complex waveforms, AM and FM, disk drive support, and it would run PC-DOS, MS-DOS, or CPM-86. And it was going to cost $300 once it hit mass market. Its target was the Apple IIc again. We how, are, how are they going to run uh, MS-DOS in 68,000? Not sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, this, was, this, was, this was the word from Amiga ah. that got back to us. Oh, okay. So this is like marketing. Uh, marketing. Yeah. <laughs> well, this was, uh, you know, pre... We hadn't actually made a deal, we were just uh, sure, sure. Just finding out. So uh, let's see, well, we briefed Marshall on this. I was in this meeting. He wanted to be first with a 32-bit machine. Uh, we said, well, 32-bit system's not possible because of lead times. It requires a new software base. So he said, well, what if you got rid of the custom display processor? <laughs>
everybody remembers Metacompo, PCPL, AmigaDOS, so, all right. Okay, this was actually, we met with them on something entirely different. We were actually looking at them. They were trying to pitch us uh, an OS for the National 3216. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you remember that period. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, but that was supposed to take over the world. Yes, it was. Yeah. Well, they also they also, and, uh, they and gra they also had graphics chips. In the they, they made like five of them? Oh, yeah. yeah. There were too many 32 bits. So we, we met with Derek Budge, uh, and he gave us the uh, this slowdown on Metacom Pro and so on. Uh, Tripos, uh, they had 18 people. They had a Pascal compiler. They had BCPL. And they were using Lattice C to uh, port their Tripos to the Quantum to the Simpler QL. And that really made it uh, a win. So we, we actually liked them. Uh, so we actually uh, started a contract with them to do something, but not Amiga. It just, this, this, this is how we met them. <coughs> we continued uh, on the 18th. Uh, we talked to Bob Pariso, and he gave us the lowdown of the software and the status. Kept looking at uh, Mega hardware, and at this point we brought the lawyer into it, Nicola Fever. Uh, Mega patents, Mega patent infringements, all sorts of uh, all sorts of things. That, that got kind of messy. Um, and we talked to uh, <coughs> Jay. We started talking with our chip guys uh, to investigate how to get the Amiga chips into MOS's process. You know, they were looking at. Things like the spice model, differences in processes, getting test tapes, MLS, the differences in design rules, um, metal pitch differences, all that stuff that you know necessary for MLS to actually consider making the Amiga chips. Had, so I imagine they breadboarded it at that point. Had they fabricated the chips for the first time? No. Okay. But there was a there was a breadboard, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. a functional yeah. breadboard with pieces of which are still exist. Okay, uh, we also got, to, at that point, finally, we got the full Amiga specs. Um, and we were able to actually start costing out the machine. Elroy Schoenfeld uh, was able to start looking at how much it would cost us to actually build this thing. And I was uh, started looking around for application software for the uh, machine. What, who was working for what? Because they, Amiga, had actually reached out to software developers, third-party software developers. And there were already people who you know, we're thinking about the Amiga, working on, actually, come to think of it, there might, there were chips at this point. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there were chips. Oh, wow. okay. Yeah. Yeah, that was, yeah. Yeah, mid, I'm sorry. Mid-84. Yeah, mid-84. Yeah. There were definitely chips. chips. Yeah. I know. Yeah, they were, they were at the, I guess they were at the Zoro back plane. Yeah. Zoro motherboard by then? Yeah. In the black metal cases. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah they were the black. Stiff. Yeah, that was the one after the Lorraine. Right. So it was a yeah. wooden keyboard yeah. and black metal case. Yep. Yeah, and, and some real prototype chips with right. different names. Right. <laughs> different names. <laughs> different names. <laughs> so as you can see, we continue to evaluate the Amiga chips. We started putting more people on it, like Matt and Shaw. Um, and I was uh, given the task of designing, a, a roughing out a C64 successor using the Amiga chips. <laughs> So, um, let's see, what game should we port? Should we do a cartridge <coughs> or a disc? You know, little questions like that. But I was get, you know, 32K ROM. Uh, minor little, minor yeah. little decisions. So, uh, yeah, I was going to go with 32K ROM, uh, <laughs> graphics library, sprite library, sound library, maybe animation, who knows, uh, text routine, and disc. And uh, we, I was going to expect the developers to treat it like a 64, you know, get those registers directly, because that's what they want. <laughs> want to hit the middle. At the uh, 25th, we've got our first full Amiga memory map, and I realized that that was stupid. The, 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 we're not going to be able to hit the, memory, the registers directly. Um, on the 27th, we bought Metacompo a Sage computer, because we wanted them to start thinking 68,000 uh, at that point. Mm -hmm. Okay, 29th. Um, we, uh, it was time for the uh, trip for the uh, trip out to Omega. Uh, Martin Shabilsky and Madeline Shaw were the people who went out there to actually meet with the engineers for the except 
For the first time, really. Right. Yeah. We, were, we were running ahead with this. Where were they physically? Uh, well, Martin and Madeline were in Westchester, uh, and the Amiga people were in Los Gatos. So let's see. Hey, we we prep Martin with questions uh, for the trip, like how do they do color area fill? Are there enough cycles to change the sprite width? Um, why did why is the mouse logic on Daphne? You know, little little things. Like, oh, and the big one. This I would, the horizontal beam counter resolution was only register was only nine bits. So how did they go to six forty? Little, little things like that. And uh, how can we make the, uh, can the chipset be used with something other than a 68K? Because we still hadn't decided that we were going to go to 68K. Okay, on the 30th, that was the meeting with the team, uh, had an interesting thing. We, we went, we, we reviewed the software. Carl Sassenrath, uh, uh, he was the OS kernel guy. The, at that time, the, oh, the exec was 6K, and his target was 4K in the final product. They had a really strange idea that the, the intermediate product, the thing they had now, was going to shrink for the final version. <laughs> and nowhere, never in the history of software has this <laughs> happened. But that, okay. Well, it, it happens when someone holds a gun here. Maybe. So, executives, oh, this was the. Kernel of the operating system, the, the test schedule, that kind of thing? Yes, uh, it did. Uh, the, the ROM calls through its uh, library concept uh, handled every, all lists for double in length, um, timerless message based operating system, uh, task switch within uh, 110 microseconds, all re entrant code, and basically kept everything on lists memory, interrupts, uh, exceptions, ports, everything. No kind of checking at all. So, you know, it was just basically performance. This is all uh, 68,000 assembly. All, all 68,000 assembly. Yep. Uh, we looked at the graphics library with Dale Luck. Uh, that was 16K bytes, and Dale was not going to shrink it at all. That was his, I mean, 16K was where he wanted it to be. It was going to stay that way. It had display operations, raster operations, line draw, flip. Layers was not done then. Uh, but it was basically viewports, copper lists, you know, all the features that you know from uh, the final Amiga. Dale had a very strong idea of what it should do and how it was doing it. RJ, uh, everybody remembers RJ? Okay, he was, at that point, he was Mr. Animation, not Intuition. So he did the animation library, it was 12K bytes, 99% uh, in Whitesmith C. That was the C of choice back then for the Amiga development. Uh, virtual sprites using the copper list, a maximum of 50. And if, if all the virtual sprites were used up, it would automatically use bobs, the uh, litter objects. Uh, Kodiak, uh, Bob Burns, he, was, he showed off the text library. It was uh, 8K at the time, including 3K of fonts. The final was going to shrink to 4K with uh, and, and the fonts were separate. All assembler, no C. The fonts at that point were named Helva, Carla, Dale, Olga II, and Rosa. <laughs> so, all different. Tim Dicker, uh, a Williams guy, uh, he was a uh, music. His uh, Whitesmith C music library was 5K of code, um, sound generation, and here's where I have the uh, the ball demo, for example, took uh, 512k bytes total of sound. Uh, the instrument was 256k, or 256 bytes, with 16 bytes for the envelope. Um, let's see. So basically, we came out away with uh, seeing that the Amiga operating system at that time was 128k bytes of ROM, uh, including 20k for the debugger. Yeah. But they were going to shrink it to 42K for the final thing. <laughs> well, it, it's easy as long as you leave out two out of every three bits. <laughs> right, and that was going to include 6K that did, 
of device drivers for the disk drive, track disk device, and serial device, which weren't in the 128 bit. questions uh, on the 31st, uh, Adam and Sid went to Santa Clara and uh, basically said, yep, we're, we're buying them, or, you know, and negoti serious negotiations started. Uh, let's see, they, on the August 3rd, uh, you know, we were talking with them, uh, 40 third-party vendors, 60 software packages coming on release. They were already working on the more advanced chipset for next year. Um, and, you know, we were going through the things like the options, rights, sale of rights to other companies, operating expenses, stock options, and so on. Uh, let's see, and, let's see, Engin on the 8th, engineering staff meeting, 32-bit computer was committed for mid-1985. Mid the Amiga was now up to $400 to $500, but the cost would be lowered after the introduction. And we started uh, working on or talking to companies about the hard disk, which was going to be uh, 150 to $180 OEM costs, and it would be available in 18 months. On the 9th, the negotiations continued, but the option had to be extended, but both sides were negotiating in good faith, uh, and we wanted it, and rumors were starting to appear. On the 15th, did the Amiga announcement. Uh, so, you know, there were rules, only the spokesman talks about the Amiga, no one else can make any comment whatsoever, no one can say anything about lead times, and they were saying it was a 32-bit computer with advanced graphics and multitasking for the home and low-end business machine market, and that Westchester and Santa Clara would work well together. And that was basically, basically it. Wow. So, before we go on, I promise, uh, I promise, my, I work for a company called Regent, and Dave does too, and uh, I promised my boss that I would say this, uh, we're looking for hardware guys and software guys, especially software people who know Linux and device drivers, and if you really know, if you know uh, the Mac 802.11 stack, you know, Wi-Fi, we'd love to talk to you. I am some students. <laughs> Wow, amazing stuff. Um, so, I understand that uh, sort of parallel to all of this was um, uh, they first were trying to introduce it and, and uh, display it and so forth before they were actually part of, before it was part of Commodore. Is that, uh, is that true? They were, so, they were showing it around. They were showing it around. Yeah, yeah. 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 Then so, developers had uh, actual machines. Uh, yeah. I was doing software outreach. You know, developer support for the plus four. So, like, I visit Infocom, mm -hmm. and uh, they have a computer in a sealed room that I was not allowed to go into, yeah. but they were raving about. And you know, it's like mm -hmm. uh, I tried to get them interested in this 6502 thing with you know plus four <laughs> graphics. <laughs> they were saying, mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, it's, 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 we've got something much more exciting that we can't show you. Yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Well, so I suspect that may have been the Boeing demo or some version of that. Uh, uh, quite a quite a story uh, at CES 1984, uh, where it was you know, created at the last minute. But this was pretty remarkable for the time. Uh, a large ball bouncing on the screen in uh, stereo. In stereo. <laughs> in stereo. <laughs> in stereo. <laughs> the, the bounces were stereo. That was the <laughs> impressive thing. And uh, and so. My understanding is this is what they were running on. This was the, the uh, uh, Lorraine was the, the Lorraine, Lorraine was there. There were a couple different prototypes. Lorraine was one of the prototype boards. Uh, Zorro was another one. Okay. Um, yeah, that was you know basically in the early days. Um, the first one I saw inside it was actually at uh, CES '85, mm -hmm. okay. where um, I uh, uh, Bill Hurd and I in fact went back to uh, the the Amiga Suite and uh, got to take one apart because of course you want to see what's inside. We both cracked up laughing because they had a uh, they had a little tower, or if you if you if you ever d develop things, a tower is the board that you stick inside the chip socket because you because you need to add some stuff to that ah, chip. Okay. They had a tower sitting on under the I guess it was the Daphne chip at that point, and uh, every one of our C128s at that point had a tower that was done over uh, over Christmas and New Year's, 
under the 8563A column chip to phase lock it to the system because the the internal chip ne so didn't bother to phase lock. Okay. And um, so the user, user yeah. So, so such wires. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yes. It's, it's a little circuit board that was yeah that's made at the last minute. So we just start cracking up laughing. We looked inside and uh, I met with them later to discuss like parts that we actually use on our 128 and other systems. So when they went to the final motherboard for uh, for the 1000, they were they were kind of building a parallel with what we had been doing using some of the same parts. Because for some reason back then, if you used the same parts, it was actually an advantage rather than these days when, you know, oh, we can only get so many of that part. You better use a different part for that one. Apparently, yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's traditional for the uh, board layout guy to put a chip upside down. And that's what a lot of the towers corrected. Ah, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, that, yeah. They, they, no, that, pin one goes here and not there. Oh, right. Our, our very our very first 68,030 product uh, prototype had the 68,030 on the other. It was the, it was oh, done, it was done upside down. down. Well, no, actually, that's that was the thing I learned from that. It was supposed to be put on correctly. It was a mistake that was put on backwards, and I'm like, oh, this is easier to probe. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's good. Yeah, yeah. So I guess they weren't all mistakes after that. <laughs> yeah, no, I had a friend who, who did that with a, a, a PGA chip and mm -hmm. manually yeah. rewired it. It was pretty. Yeah, 68,030 is that point, or PGA. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not that, that was before they had the uh, PLCCs. Yeah. So it made it. In yeah. 1985, it actually came out, the Amiga 1000. Let's, let's see what the score is. So uh, let's see. You, you said they were originally targeting 128K, they went up to 200 6K. No, no, they were. It was 128k for the uh, what they had then, but they were going to reduce it to. Uh, ah, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, talking you're talking about the RAM. RAM. Sorry, yeah. RAM. Yeah, 100k. RAM. They were planning 128k expandable. Oh, this. So this was actually uh, 56k expandable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's a little little yeah. door, mm -hmm. little door in the front that let you put in the 256k. But pretty breathtaking stuff, actually. For 496 colors on the screen. Yep, 12, yeah. 12 bit colors. They did, they did uh, overcome that 3,600. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 they, they must have fixed it. Yeah. And 640 bit 400. 400 is an amazing number because you can't do that on a single NTSC frame. You've got to do interlace. Yeah. Um, yep. So that was, that was a huge thing. Um, it would do uh, 6 bit planes, most 8 sprites per scan line. 8-bit audio channels would go up to 24 kilohertz. That's pretty. That's pretty heavy stuff for that that speed. And you know, an actual hardware glitter. There were not too many things that could move graphics around like that at that point. In fact, we uh, I think some of the some of the uh, third parties were doing uh, benchmarking on and to do their own glitter routines, trying to be faster than the glitter over the years. And you had to get to a pretty good 68,020 yeah. before you could go faster than the glitter, and that's because the 68,020 has a hardware barrel shifter. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. And Jay actually, Jay Minor actually objected when everyone, anyone called it a glitter, uh, because it could do math operations as yeah. it uh, as it glittered. It was more than just a copy engine. Yeah. So he wanted to call it a, a glimmer. I think. Glimmer. Okay. Yeah, 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 but that yeah, never came up. Yeah, okay. yeah, it could do mathematics because it could do. It was three operands, and almost everybody else's glitter was just two operands. So I have a, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so this was the, uh, it actually ended up being called Blitter, at least in the, the meeting. Oh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. Jay, that, was just, that was kind of the name that had already been agreed yeah. upon in the industry. Jay, Jay was the only person who would wanted to, you know, uh, okay. to do the blimmer. Ah, uh, okay. Ah, uh, okay, right, right. And I wanted to call Bob's Blobs. <laughs> that didn't catch on either. That's really a shame. I know, glitter yeah. objects, right? Yeah, glitter yeah, objects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes good sense, yeah. Oh, right, so it, it, it takes, it, it would do arbitrary uh, three operand, uh, any uh, any boolean operation, any boolean function. Through. That's, yeah, that's pretty neat stuff. You could actually do life with it. That's fun. I'm sure somebody did that at one point. Oh, yeah. 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 And of course, the uh, in fact, the uh, the uh, floppy was encoded in decoded with Twitter. Oh. <laughs> makes good sense. Yeah, this is right. This was basically unheard of in 1985 to have um, uh, custom shapes.
ships responsible for so much, able to do so much at the time. Right. So this was the, the, the earlier Lorraine prototype. And uh, well, let's see. We have Agnes, uh, Daphne, and Portia. Uh, I guess half of whom disappeared. So uh, Denise, uh, Daphne became Denise, and uh, Portia became Paula. Okay. Yeah. So some yeah. some some people got dumped. So they had to change the names of the ships. Yeah. Basically. Yeah, amazing thing. So, uh, so here's Agnes with the. Um, um, oh, uh, this one here, he managed to get the Vimmer in. <laughs> oh, there, oh, there you go. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and this also this 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 unusual uh, copper coprocessor. Can yeah. You, so, what's the what's the story on that? I have some guesses about where that may have come from. Um, well, the, the the copper is basically a. Uh, a it was a video synced coprocessor and it could put out uh, it could put that put out um, register address uh, information and, and load or save registers. So the interesting thing about the uh, the uh, Amiga bus is that there's a, there's you can see it in there. There's the register address. Um, register address is, is can add can access registers but it also sort of sends commands to chips um, in that it that controls all the all the DMA, every DMA channel that's run out there is a, is you know every uh, uh, DMA resources things that things that happen via DMA channels are all assigned to register addresses, and so like video fetch, well each each bit plane had its own RGA address, um, you know floppy sound, all of that had RGA addresses. So the copper basically puts you, you, you has things like wait for you know, wait for a beam position. Do some do some copper stuff, so it could go and reload all your color registers, or it could move sprites around, or it could do all that. Anything. It could load yeah. the uh, different. Yeah. It could change the sprite pointers on the on the 64. You know, changing the sprite pointers was actually problematic for software because we get locked out on some some scan lines. Uh, you could never predict that, but with the copper list, you know, we know we could get that through. Mm -hmm. So like uh, like doing split screen on the 64. That was a tricky because, like Logo, for example, wanted a split screen, but there were certain places I couldn't split the screen because <laughs> the 64 was the processor was locked out at that time. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, I, we get these flickering. Yeah, yeah. Al, uh, Al was, was here earlier talking about that, so you could, you, you know, annoy him with the, you know, oh, why did you steal this bus during these cycles? But yeah, but this was this was quite a bit different in that it was sort of designed up front to be able to do. Stuff synchronously with the with the beam. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's so I think the uh, Atari 400 and 800 uh, has something almost like this, but not quite as quite as fancy. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, so Jay Miner designed those chips as well. If yeah. I remember. Yeah, and that they had their fire missile graphics, which were you know, a bit different. Yeah, a bit, but the yeah a similar idea to a sprite. So uh, let's see. Oh, and another thing that I sort of couldn't believe when I was going through was um, 25 channels of DMA. Yeah. Well, the thing is that it's you know we put out basically when you put out a register bus address, um, every chip knows what that means, including it can be there could be a DRAM read, a DRAM write. Um, certain chips get involved, other chips ignore it. So that made DMAs very simple because you basically uh, Agnes is controlling everything. It puts out an address, puts an address on the RGA bus, and everything responds the way it's supposed to. It's all it's all baked in. You can't change it. Well, I mean, some, a few of them are flexible, but you know, like for instance, it, you know, you the, the the thing we use to let the CPU in there uh, went away when uh, when we were grabbing too much stuff because of course the chips had priority to their own bus. Um, but yeah, it was. I mean, it was a real elegant system. It, it was maintained um, going well into the future. Uh, there's stuff that we were working on near the end that never made it out the door that was still, even though it was completely revamped chips, we're still doing things kind of the same way. Well, so that's that's an interesting question. So yeah. there were many, many models of the idea that came out, I mean, compared to like well, the other 64 or something right. like that. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. Um, uh, so how much of a hassle was backwards compatibility? Seemed like there were a lot, there were a lot of registers and a lot of things did sort of go and attack them fairly directly. Well, we, 
we, we had the advantage or disadvantage of not having a whole lot of changes for a bunch of years to start with because of, uh, well, the decisions that were made at management level that we had no control over. Mm -hmm. um, there's, I, I think there's some software weirdnesses that you had to deal with. Um, there's some, there's some tricks with. Uh, I know they had, they had to deal, they had to also work around uh, application software, like games, kind of grabbing resources, but not completely shutting the operating system down. So, so yeah, the, having an op a real operating system was actually a big advantage. Um, yeah. People weren't actually poking the chips directly; they were using the graphics library. They were, you know, using. Wow. They were using raw input uh, to get you know input, so they, they weren't using all of it, but uh, they weren't most things weren't poking the chips directly. Oh. So that, that however we every uh, OS version upgrade we had to go through an extensive compatibility testing phase, mm -hmm. and some some companies like Electronic Arts uh, were really annoying, uh, oh. mostly because of memory usage. Uh, they would figure out how much stack a particular routine was taking and make sure that you know, that was exactly how much stack they allocated. So, uh, you know, and if we like added a, yes. oh, <laughs> an extra register on the stack at that point, you know, for that routine, oh, well, their, their program they stopped working. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, and um, I mean, we, we, we did a, uh, we, we weren't completely, um, Obsessed when we went on to extending the chipsets for compatibility because of that, because nobody was poking registers. Um, it was actually okay if a few programs failed. Yeah. Um, it wasn't okay if, if they all failed. <laughs> we, were, um, we were shooting for ninety percent. Yeah. Unlike the one twenty eight where they demanded a hundred percent, we were willing to give up ninety percent. Uh, yeah. Give up so, yeah. So when we went to, when we went to the Pandora chips, um, we. The copper lists weren't directly compatible. I think in in in, in every mode, at least, um, there were. I mean, there were a lot more cop. There were a lot more registers available because you had all 256 uh, um, color registers in the lot available oh, okay. through the to the oh, copper okay. list, which had not been there before. Um, there was uh, um, when we went to uh, even before that, we went to uh, Omega 3000. I, I, for hardware, we had we had compatibility issues as well. We had to look into. Um, Part of that was internal, and in that the bridge card had to work, or I got hit over the head with a stick. So um, there were a few things about the uh, about the bus that had been designed um, as an expansion bus that hadn't really been formalized that then became formalized because um, of the behavior of certain things. Um, I we ran into some third party boards that were fairly like there was this thing called Amiga Live that was a you know live video digitizer. Um, that didn't work in the 3000 on the 32-bit bus when we first got it. It was a 16-bit car, it was supposed to run in compatibility mode. They were breaking some rules. Um, I actually got them, it's kind of nice when you're a commoner, you can say, send me your PAL equations and I'll tell you what you did wrong. I also told them how to fix it without changing, with, with just by changing the PAL. They didn't have to run any new wires because they were just not qualifying something with address strobe or whatever. And it was, it was, it saw some noise on the bus that didn't, that was for 32-bit people only that it was responding to. Um, so, but you know, the thing is, I mean, we also had problems with, uh, you know, with application with applications that were not 32-bit clean. When, once we started wanting to add 32-bit memory, um, some of the some of the uh, some of the support people had written uh, tools that let you find that out ahead of time. If you use if you could test on a machine with an MMU, you could use the MMU to find your bugs. Um, one was one was called Enforcer, and um, it, it was you know it was kind of a Developer tool, but before you knew it, um, all of the magazines knew about Enforcer, had their own copy, and would write bad reviews if you got Enforcer hits. Uh, yeah. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> and we had Memo. Yeah, yeah. Memo. Because uh, all memory was allocated through with Zek, you couldn't just grab memory. We could actually do stuff on the allocation and free to check for whether or not you've wow. violated the limit. Actual, the actual operating system discipline. Well, it was the idea, the idea was to discipline it on a machine that could discipline it, that would then allow you to have those those bug fixes on every machine because the older machines obviously couldn't, and and the operating system really never been written to support at the time to support MMUs, um, but well, yeah. So you didn't have an MMU in the sixty-eight thousand right, 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 right. Yeah. When when did you first the, fir the first MMU was in the uh, the 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 A2620 add-on card for the 2000. Mm -hmm. 
So when, when I when I took over the 2000, there was there had been a uh, there, the the, two, the original 2000 was based on the 1000 plus. There's a schematic diagram in a book called Schematics and Expansion Specifications that was made back when it was the Zorro motherboard. Mm -hmm. So that's where the Zorro bus got its name, is because there was a there was a there was an add-on card that just had you know Zorro on there, which meant it was for the Zorro motherboard. But you know they because they hadn't changed the they wouldn't know if they were going to change the expansion bus. In fact, that I think back then it was an expansion chimney. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the cards were enormous. Yeah, uh, and it was going to go in. The, I think the uh, next generation machine was called the Ranger. Yeah, right. Well, that was their next gen. Yeah, their 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 idea of the next generation was going to do. They were going to have some twi tweaks for a high res bitmap mode. But then it was yeah. also going to have a page yeah. built in with those yeah. enormous cards. Yeah, yeah. So so anyway, the uh, so so um, where was where was I where was I going with this? Um, what? And then, oh, so yeah, so so um, it turns out that the, the the two guys who started the uh, the Amiga 500 came up with Fat Agnes it was Bob Welland and George Robbins, and they had been the guys doing the what Andy mentioned before the Z8000 machine, which was Z8000 machine was think of basically a, a kind of like a Sun 2. They were going to have a, a megapixel bitmap display with GUI. Um, they had, Running coherent, running coherent, Williams coherent, which was you know Unix clone, mm -hmm. and um, it ran a uh, one of the guys, Rico Tudor, had written his own super fast windowing system, which was basically just to it wasn't like you think of in a, on an Amiga or a Macintosh or something. It was really just to have multiple terminals, but it was a windowing system and it was it was wicked fast, um, and uh, so so they they still wanted a machine that would run Unix of some sort, so. Um, um, Bob Mellon's dastardly plan was to build a 68,020 add-on card, and in the 2000, when I was building the 2000, it's like, well, I, you know, I have this extra slot here that I don't need anymore because I could put a megabyte on the main board, and that had been, that was really just the edge of the 1000, that connector, mm -hmm. pretty much. So I decided that, well, it, it ought to have some additional protocols in there since I was integrating the bus controller, all the PALs and stuff into a single bus controller called Buster. I said, well, I'm going to have a, a new protocol that lets you just plug in a chip, and that chip can request to be master of the whole system, and you don't have to take your 68,000 out or anything. And so we had, you know, built-in idea, built-in plan for an expansion card that gave you new, better CPU. Because, of course, you know, we were using the same CPU in 1987, 1987 that, you know, that Amiga had used in 1985. So, so we, um, so the first one, had the uh, had the uh, had the Motorola um, 68851 MMU on it, as well as the 881 math chip, and two two megabytes of real 32-bit memory on it, and that was uh, that became the uh, Amiga 2000 slash 20. Yeah, this is all. This is yeah. now being something else I need to add to my collection. Yeah, yeah. So Amiga 2000 slash 20 was was it, now that was that was running 14.3 megahertz uh, clock, which came from the, the quadrature clocks that we had. We had seven and a, we had a signal called uh, CDAC, which was seven megahertz delay by 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. So I could make a 14 megahertz clock with an XOR gate. <laughs> and, uh, and actually, we kind of that kind of got past the FCC guys, because they always look, they, they pay a lot more attention if there's an oscillator on the board. Uh -huh. um, but that was the first generation. Then um, I, uh, we made a second one with the 68,030. One, one day, uh, one of the managers, Gerard Lucas, uh, or maybe it was Jeff Porter, one of them came to me and said, oh, we're getting a 68,000, the prototype 68,030 chip in next week. That's all they said. A week later, I had a card plug it in, which I designed, redesigned from scratch, basically spent the entire week without sleep, because I didn't want it to just work on a, uh, on, I didn't want to run a 14.3 anymore. I wanted to run a 25 megahertz, possibly a 33. Uh, so I had to figure out how to do it asynchronously. So it would be so you could go out to the 68,000 bus at normal speed, but run faster um, because we the 030 had built-in MMU. Uh, we didn't have to have space. There was enough room down there for four megabytes of uh, of, of, of DRAM, and uh, this was the one that had the processor on the wrong side of the board because um, Fisher Terry Fisher's layout guy who was doing all, basically all my boards back then um, hadn't quite noticed the bottom view. <laughs> because again, this was going to this was something that we were going to do in about a week because I knew this chip was coming in, 
And um, yeah, that was the Commodore was like that. Like you know, I I could just build this thing, tell uh, you know, tell Porter or Lucas that like, oh, I have this thing uh, I just did. Oh, we'd like, to, can we can we make it? <laughs> can we get a, can we get overnight turn on it? The sixty-eight hundred thirty-four ever make your market? Yeah, yeah that yeah. became the that became the uh, the Amiga three thousand slash thirty. And uh, that's the one the first one we got uh, Amiga units running on. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that one that had a, that actually had enough for, enough memory to really run Amiga Unix. I actually ran Amiga Unix. Well, it was called the Amix. It wasn't Amiga Unix. So the first one was Amix because that was before you were allowed to use Unix in your Unix name. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Then Amix ran in two megabytes, <laughs> but like if you loaded a new Emacs, it would thrash. Mm -hmm. You would cost yeah. nothing but hard disk activity. So it really, really wasn't practical. So you could virtual memory, but it wasn't practical. Four, four megabytes four was actually yeah. enough to run it pretty well. You could have to run an <laughs> UI and run. Uh, yeah, I it, think it was Gosling GFX. Right? I did. No, it was, it was definitely. I, I I'm not sure. Was, I use so I use Gosling ZMAX too. I ever some Carnegie yeah. Mellon. That's because <laughs> that's pretty rotated. Oh, but but um, yeah, I, I maybe it was Gosling ZMAX. It was ZMAX anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was big. Chip was the, I think, 
the largest NMOS chip commoner ever made, and they were very worried about breaking things um, because it was so large. Uh, Lisa was brand new chip done in CMOS. Um, Commodore actually had a CMOS process there. We had a one and a half micron CMOS process. It wasn't really what you wanted for Lisa, so we were also making them at HP in their one micron process. Uh, but this was really before contract chip babbing was was much of a thing. I mean, you could get it done, but it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't a big business for anybody. So, so you kind of had to ask nicely and and not make mistakes like like forgetting to order the parts six months or a year in advance or whenever you needed them, um, which of course Commodore did, trying to roll these machines out. But we had, I had the, I had the, uh, the first AA machine up and running in January of 91, but there was a chip problem, we couldn't get a display. So, so early in February we got a new chip in. I forget which, I, even though Lisa was a display chip, I think it might have been an Alice problem. But anyway, we've got new Alice. We got the new chip in. It booted Kickstart. Um, it had some issues because, of course, couldn't use any of the new registers. But um, but it worked. It ran. You know, and, and it was uh, it was a uh, it was about a year and a half before they got it out the door because of management flip flops and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it was uh, but but because of the because of the limitations on particularly on the Alice design, they couldn't. They, you know, they couldn't go and add chunky pixels at that point. They couldn't add a bunch of other stuff um, just because it was it was beyond the scope. Now we pushed really hard to get a CMOS version of the of the address processing chip. You know, the, you know and, and, and CMOS Alice done. There was talk of doing a double A plus, um, and that was mostly driven by George Robbins, who because triple A was never going to be something you could put in an A five hundred type machine. It was just be too expensive. So they were at least, you know, unless we had gone to another level of integration, because you know, four or six custom chips that are bigger than any of the custom chips in any of the machines today, you know, or you know, back beyond you know, uh, Amiga, Amiga chips, um, was going to be an issue. Makes, makes good sense. Oh, I wanted to uh, uh, show this uh, this pre picture. So I think we're actually looking at what you could see on. So this is using the hold and mode. Oh yeah, it's hand mode, yeah. Yeah. So what? What was? Uh, were you involved in, in that, or was that another thing that sort of? I mean, I've heard stories about it. Yeah, that, um, yeah. That, that came with the original chips. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was, it was originally part of the chips. And uh, I think it was an accident. <laughs> I, 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 I mean. Well, I had heard. I had heard that the that they were originally talking about um, uh, doing. YUV color instead of RGB color. Oh, sure. So whole modify makes a lot more sense if you've got a Y. If your if your if your internal color processing is YUV instead of right, right. instead of RGB, mm -hmm. um, which of course if you're building a game machine, you know but they weren't really building a game machine, but they had, you know early on it was good. You know they were they were selling it as a game machine. Right. They wanted to build a personal they computer. Ultimately, but, succeeded as a game yes. machine. But yeah. Well, yeah, it, it yeah it was it was very popular for well it was it was computer gaming. It had something it was computer, yeah, it was okay. computer gaming. Yeah. You know, the, actually, the, uh, the the one that really was a game machine, the CD32, was uh, was that one of those victims of not having enough parts. Mm. Oh, funny! I'd be doing dealing with that um, all of these years later, which that, it's been a bit bad year for parts that, in the last two years as well, quite, quite. <laughs> for completely other reasons. Mm. Yeah, I was struck by the interesting mix of. Things almost all devoted toward graphics, but then of course there was the whole audio yeah. uh, system, which was amazing at the time as well. Um, let's see. So one of the things that was amazing is it, it had the ability to do, uh, you know, they called it dual play fields, right? Mm -hmm. It was never referred to as a frame buffer; it was always a play field or something. Yeah. 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 I, I, Andy was saying, they, yeah, we, yeah. We, we really only use that for the sliding screens in the operating system. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, where you can slide. I mean, it, oh, right. Okay. The yeah. earlier, the pre-intuition user interface actually made use of that to uh, do more than one thing at a time. Oh, but okay. uh, once intuition kicked in and started using the layers, mm -hmm. uh, that really got ignored. You kind of have to. You'd have to be programming the system pretty close to the metal to be able to use that, I guess, because the operating system didn't like it. Uh, the operating system used it fine, but it was uh, didn't like it. it did, the user interface just didn't do it much with it, except to have. You know, multiple, multiple sliding screens. Oh, okay. Yeah, makes sense. And it, it has.
that is also a curious mixture. I'm trying to think about systems that would have this, where it both has uh, the, the blit facility, which is the, the block yeah. transfer, so you'd be able to copy one thing to another, um, and true hardware sprites. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, again, I'm curious if you, if you know the genesis of this or what the effect of all of that, of, of having both facilities available, it seems quite unusual. I think I mentioned uh, that earlier. Uh, there's a limit to the number of virtual sprites that you can get by uh, playing comparable games to change the pointer. Uh, yeah. And uh, but games wanted more moving objects than that, and this litter was just sitting there. So uh, uh, okay. RJ in his first animation library uh, would do both. You know, he'd, uh, he'd do a sprite, okay. virtual sprites until he ran out, and then he'd switch to uh, blobs or bobs rather. Oh wow! Okay. And that, and that was sufficiently seamless that you could actually program with it and sort of yeah. not know that yeah. it's right. off. Okay. It would be hidden from the, uh, you know, the programmer. Another reason for using the operating system. Yeah, yeah. No, that is, that is but that, that animation library didn't really uh, survive. Mm -hmm. uh, it would said uh, RJ would switch to intuition mm -hmm. to, uh, and graphic craft and uh, text. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Well, yeah, I'm actually. It makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it makes sense. Uh, okay. Especially since that was quite that. 
that work was never quite finished. Nope, not, not quite <laughs> but it'd been a little easier. Interesting. Uh, let's see. So we're doing okay on time, but um, I was thinking at this point, if, there, if we have questions from the audience, maybe this would be the best. Uh, this would be a time to switch over for it. We have an extra microphone. question, and I know this probably is more focused for Andy. By the time System Software 2 was coming out, which is also coincided with the, with the 3000, you know, very powerful, made the cover of Byte Magazine, everyone knows that. Was there ever a time, was there any consideration for a network file system extension? And I ask because I know that the, the 2065 card was available for the Unix style uh, 2500s and above, but yet it never made it into the 3000 and the like. And is that something that even made it into the discussions for the specification or just where resources to assign to it? That was my assumption. Yeah. It, seemed, it would have been necessary, well, would have been much helpful to the system at the time. We, want, we did want, uh, we did want to support uh, an, an NFS uh, library, uh, but uh, that just never happened. Resources, time, and uh, lack of uh, lack of management interest, I think, is the thing. I had a guy uh, who was actually uh, working on that, uh, but never uh, yeah. never made it into a product. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I understand there are limitations. Timeline of like May '84 to September, um, the purchase of Amiga, uh, and uh, so uh, uh, Trivial had acquired Atari in July of that year. Did you guys have any so, uh, knowledge of the relationship or what was going on with Trivial and Atari? No, no, and he uh, he acquired. Well, yeah, the Amiga. It, it was really weird. Uh, I'm looking over the timeline, and uh, Amiga canceled the contract. With uh, Terminal and returned the money on August 13th, which was, uh, and Commodore announced the acquisition of Amiga the next day. So uh, uh, I don't understand how that quite worked so well, but <laughs> that's, what, that's, that's how it went down. Um, so clearly, that was the uh, getting out of the contract was, uh, you know, had to, have to start happening after May and uh, before August 13th. another system specification type question. At the time that the, <coughs> the 2000 was coming out, 
or being developed and hard drive interface or controller being made available. This, uh, this is more, I guess, a question for uh, Dave. What happened such that auto boot didn't come out when the 2000 came out and had to be, the card had to be re-offered another year later? That seems, well, it seems sort of obvious from the outside, and I remember that my uh, PC-centric uh, colleagues at the time couldn't understand how a, a large box computer system would still need a floppy to start. Um, I guess there, there are some software issues <laughs> with the uh, with the auto boot um, in 1.2. I guess it was fixed in 1.3. Um, that's my recollection. Uh, I don't remember exactly what the issues were. Um, it was uh, there. There was a there was a whole system for this uh, for discovering uh, um, for, for discovering uh, ROM tags uh, in in uh, expansion devices that, that told you. Uh, told the device, uh, you know, various things, and eventually we're fine. But uh, yeah, that's that's my understanding of it. Is that a lot of the stuff is kind of happening all at once. So, you know, I was working on the Amiga 2000. Jeff Boyer was working on the 20, uh, 2090, the first hard disk controller. Um, you know, there were, the software had already been written, um, and. It, you know, it just it took it, it took some actual hardware to test it. That's again one of those problems of writing the software before the hardware is available. Um, I you know, but again, I don't know exactly what the problems were. Uh, on a related note, um, so one of the things I find a little unusual is uh, computers at that time. A lot of them had enormous ROMs, you know, a full operating system, that are nearly so. It sounds. We're making choices like that as well. I'm curious if they were thinking in terms of, oh, well, you know, no, this is not how it's going to go forward, or, or how were how were those decisions made? Kickstarter was supposed to be a run. Okay. Ah, okay. It was not done in time. So uh, at the last minute, or it was changed to a, a disk-loaded RAM system mm. because uh, these, the OS just wasn't done in time. Otherwise, it would have been a ROM. Yeah, that, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Those days, you worked the ROM. You, did, you actually had mass ROMs that were oh, made, yeah. made mass production. You couldn't change it. Yeah. And um, I guess the you know, it, it, there later on, they could actually kind of patch ROM routines. But I'm not sure. Oh, we could do. We could do that. that was yeah. part of the original yeah. thing. Okay. But it was just too, too much. Far off. Yeah, too too far away from yeah. the, what you're really going to need. You know, obviously they wanted to ship the middle. If they'd stuck with the uh, Christmas 85, I think they could have had ROMs, mm -hmm. but not in the middle of uh, 85. Mm -hmm. ah. Yeah, and of course, you know, after after we got ROMs, everybody wanted the uh, Kickstarter back. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's uh, I ended up writing that for uh, in, in in for the MMU machine later on. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some other computer used all the available slots at MOS <coughs> in 85. <laughs> so I know most people remember the Amiga as like a gaming computer, and maybe that's how it started. I work for a company that really did use the Amiga mostly for video. We were, yeah. we were a bar in a sense, and I was building video toasters like gangbusters, like mm -hmm. for a while. And even before that, you had like Sculpt 3D, and you had a lot of 3D stuff. Did that shift in the market change the shift in engineering at Commodore? Because for a lot of people, the Amiga was a gaming machine, but for a lot of people, the Amiga was a cheap SGI. It was their way. I mean, they stuck a genlock on it. They were doing titling. Did that sh did that market shift change engineering internally? Um. Well, from from a software point of view, uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat, we'd like to do whatever New Tech wanted, <laughs> because they were, uh, you know, they were doing great things, and there were uh, within Commodore, we uh, we did see, see that you know desktop video was something the Amiga was perfect for, uh, but it may have been a little too early for like the customer base. Desktop video was. You know, specialty places, 
not everyone did uh, their own YouTube videos because YouTube didn't exist. Uh, so if it had been, if there had been more consumer interest, desktop video might have been a, a big thing back then. Because around around ninety, I think Harry Topperman took over, and you saw the Amiga AUX, and then you saw the the Lowell board, and you saw machines that we couldn't understand why Commodore was even building. Hmm. And so we were, it was kind of like to us the future was desktop video, and we didn't understand why we were seeing stuff. The network boards we we understood, but we couldn't understand why. Why we were seeing machines that weren't video related. So I guess we were very, very focused on video, and we didn't know what was going on internally with the content. Yeah, the U Lowell board was kind of a weird thing in that it, that had been just a small project that Commodore was sponsoring. Mm -hmm. And you know, occasionally they'd come in and show me what they were doing, and I'd tell them, you did that wrong, you did that wrong, you know, just to just the bus interface and not the not you know, not their part of it, not their not their TI graphics chip, but um, but you know, and then it seemed like it was going to go along with me Unix as something you could, but the me Unix was just you know that was being pushed for other markets. Um, you know it doesn't hurt to it doesn't hurt to have your uh, you know to find new places to sell your equipment. Um, and, you know in the U.S. U.S. never quite figured out what they wanted to be in Europe. Every yeah, it was all gaming. That's all they cared about. Um, here it was mostly the video you know the, the desktop video market, and so. It was kind of, you know, it was it was split a little bit just based in, in product lines, like A500, A1200 were for gaming, and A2000, 3000, 4000 were, were you know, for, for video stuff. And, you know, I know we, we got, you know, even, we even had the, the 4000T with two video slots in it. Um, that, you know, the video slot was just something that George Robbins and I came up with when we were deciding what, what neat stuff we could do with this 2000 that we had inherited. Um, he was mostly staying with the 500, but I was taking all the 500 stuff, putting it in there, and thinking, what else can we do? And the slot they had, they had put had an internal slot, which kind of like their CPU slot was it was the same as the external slot. It was really just so I had put an internal gen lock. I said, well, that's kind of silly because we have like all we have the whole digital video bus. Why don't we run that over? And then George said, hey, we should put uh, we should run a parallel port there too. And you know, if I had to do it over again, I'd see if I could get permission to put in another CIA chip or something. So it had or some other way to control it, but at least we had some way you could, you could make it do stuff. And um, that was that was really with the you know with the idea that this will make it better for doing video stuff because I have a place to put the things that video people need that I can't build into the machine, um, you know, other than the regular slots. But it wasn't, uh, you know, I mean, there wasn't, I, you know, I didn't see a whole lot of strategy coming from the top on any of this stuff. Um, we discussed it at the engineering level, but you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like, it wasn't like we had a big powwow of all the, you know, the heads of marketing and and sales and, and management saying, you know, this is our future direction. We should do this and that. Though, surprise, we were surprisingly in in the chip group, we were surprisingly pushing high, like the AAA chips. Video guys would have loved that. They were too expensive for gaming machines, at least when they, if they had come out. If they had come out in, say, um, you know, 2000 when they should have, or, I mean, not, excuse me, 1990 when they should have, or <laughs> 1992 when they should have, or even 1994 when they should have, except Commodore never spent enough money on any of that stuff, so it never, had, it never got out the door. But, you know, that's... Uh, <clears throat> What are you going to do? I mean, you know, they were, they, you know, from the engineering perspective, we were, we were pushing hard in that direction. I, you know, even with the, even with the 32-bit expansion bus, I was, you know, I was trying to make it better for people who wanted to add stuff on that, you know, Commodore couldn't manage everything. Um, one other mistake we were making, I think, with, with some of it was Commodore kept doing things that other companies could do pretty well, and we really should have spent more of our time doing things that only Commodore could do. Work progressing on the new Superbuster chip. Um, that kind of that kind of got stalled uh, for a number of reasons, uh, COVID and parts availability. But I, you know, <laughs> we'll have to see if we'll pick that up again. Um, yeah, was, that's a that's a 
that's a bus replacement in an FPGA, um, which may be available off the shelf at some point in the future. The shop, the, the FPGA that is. Um, there's there's an amazing crunch on some of these parts. Um, I have I have a part in one of my systems now that uh, let's just put this in perspective. You can get the you can get this part from a from a distributor, or actually from a from a broker. Uh, from Texas Instruments, they cost about 20 bucks. It's just a little power module. Um, last summer, you could get one for about 950 from the broker. Um, now, I think it's gone up to about 1,200, 1,500. No, it was 2,200. That's right. The last price I heard was 2,200. Uh, needless to say, I'm not using that part anymore. I made a little module that does the same thing. I'm not even sure we're spending 20 bucks on it. <laughs> That's probably a three-year lead time on your part, so. Uh, not yet. Uh, but that yes, and that's, if you look those if you look up those parts, a lot of these parts will have lead times going into early till mid 2023 on parts like regular everyday parts, not even something that's like super sophisticated or whatever. So I I spent all, most of last year and this year um, redesigning stuff to be able to let us use let us keep building what we've been building. So I mean it's this is a this is a, this is an actual thing with parts, and I. I, you know, I haven't actually talked to Jens about this lately, but um, you, it's not the kind of thing you want to launch in the middle of a, a we, we can't really build it issue. Um, and I, was, I, had, I had some other things that took me away from it too. It's, I'm not, that's not the entire reason, but it's, it's the best reason. <laughs> yeah, I think right at the moment, uh, retro computing, vintage computing is nearly perfect because it's, some, it's the only affordable computing around. You can afford it. And, and, yeah, you know, you can maybe you can find parts in a basement somewhere. <laughs> okay, so, uh, this is in line maybe with the uh, Buster. If you do recreate it, um, I'm sure a bunch of Amiga fans would, are wondering if there are any plans from anyone that you know in your circles to maybe do CIA chips or a couple other Amiga chips that seem to be disappearing and yeah. might never be around ever again. It's a shame. Commodore had actually done the entire 8520 in, in, uh, in I don't know if it was in M language or VHDL or whatever, but it was they they did a whole uh, a whole um, uh, design for that to build the piece that went into um, the uh, CD32, the integrated part. So they had actually they had a big you know $500 FPGA sitting in a socket running that in the lab. Who knows what happened to that, uh, that design, those design files? But yeah, it's. I mean, so it can be done. I don't know. I don't know how interesting making an 8520 would be to the average uh, VHDL person. But hey, you know, if you want to learn, you know, not not everybody can be uh, you know can be Jerry and design a you know entire C64 as your first FPGA project. But you know, it's it's you know you, the the thing is, you know, you, you you get the you get the basics down. You plug it in. Doesn't work. You figure out why. Make some changes. Doesn't work again. Figure out why. It's you know it's it's um, you know it's not like you actually have to make the silicon and spend your uh, you know your two hundred fifty thousand or whatever to find out you did it wrong. <laughs> you know so it's you know so it, you know in, in that particular instance hardware has become a lot like software. So you know that somebody somebody ought to you know I, in fact I haven't even looked up on open cores lately. There might be something pretty close to that that you could even pick up and customize. But you got to know. Something terribly interesting, uh, I guess, or probably would have happened already. But you know, as the you know, the, you'd sort of want the uh, entire Amiga to be in VHDL or Verilog or whatever at this point, just because uh, you know parts aren't becoming more available. And you know, as, you know, anybody, you know, if you look at you see that you know, oh yeah, this one's they've done the entire uh, they've done the entire um, you know Amiga chipset in a pretty compatible design. Um, of, you know, smaller parts ought to be something that could be split out or put into little towers or, you know, it, it just depends, you know, do you want, do, you, do we need to have it on a board that plugs in? Because that, that, that introduces a lot of complexities today because um, nobody's building 5-volt at, at PGAs anymore. So, you know, if you just want to plug it into a socket, you have to deal with, like, not, you know, the, the simple part is getting the 8520 to work at that point maybe. Um, 
right? That's actually one of the problems doing Buster or anything else too, is that you, you know, if you want to interface with an existing system, it makes it a more, more complicated design than if you just wanted to build that functionality for something new. Did you guys name uh, any of the other boards like you did Rock Lobster? I remember the 500 was... was oh, the they, all, they all have names on them. I mean, the, the, the A2000 motherboard was called The Boss. Um, yeah, I wonder why. Um, it was actually, well, it was a Springsteen reference. Right. Right. <laughs> and Dave was from Jersey. Yeah. Was from Jersey. I moved out in, uh, in, in 2016. I lived in at either end of Delaware now. So as long as there's a gap, I am serious about taking people's cards or resumes or whatever <laughs> yeah. for uh, software Linux device driver hackers. Uh, good company to work for and I could really use people.
So at the beginning of a chip design cycle, we get to meet with the chip designers and we tell them what we wanted. And you know they would say, no, that would take too much space, or that's a terrible idea. Or sometimes they'd say, yeah, we could do that. So you know they then go away for six months doing whatever it is that they did, and then we come back after give it to this person like Dave to put it in the system, and then we get it back. And it was always like a Christmas surprise to find out <laughs> what it actually did. Um, <laughs> Well, you know, we want we asked for this, and oh, this is different. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes it was a really nice surprise, and sometimes it was like, hmm, oh, it's full. Not, I guess full of things, you know. Um, yeah, Christmas is a good thing. You could ask for this with Santa, and he brings us something a little bit different. Yeah, yeah, he's happy. Yeah, okay, yeah. Sometimes, so, uh, it was always fun getting new peripherals, like uh, in, I guess, 80. Well, 80, 82, Commodore did a, uh, from Texas actually, a voice joystick, voice control joystick. You could, uh, you so know, up, down, up, down, left, but, but uh, it was demoed for, you know, the execs, and it just didn't work. It just, it, it, mm -hmm. So it turns out that after they gave it to us and discussed, we were playing with it, Turns out you had to use a Texas accent. You had to say left. Everything is just a little. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can't do it. But those are the fun things that come over. And you know, bringing up an OS for the first time, a new hardware, that kind of stuff was always fun. Yeah, working. Working, I guess, uh, death marches, look at them. Yeah. yeah, I always enjoy yeah, having my help stuff with Brit because it really just wouldn't stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, speaking of stopping, I think we are officially out of time okay. here. Okay. So please, let's thank our. our